hi everyone welcome back to my youtube channel or welcome if you're new here so today we're going to be talking about a very recent case it happened in the beginning of march and it's the case of sarm heslop so let's just go ahead and get right into it so sarm heslop a 41 year old woman originally from southampton hampshire the uk disappeared from the u.s virgin islands on march 7 2021 so i'd like to provide you a little bit of a backstory about sarm and how she ended up in the virgin islands for the past few months since January, Sarm had allegedly been working and living on Siren Song, her boyfriend Ryan Bain's boat. Prior to this, Sarm had worked as a flight attendant for about eight years, so almost a decade, and eventually fell in love with sailing. So in fall of 2020, Sarm met Ryan on Tinder and quickly fell in love with the self-described entrepreneur from Michigan. Prior to coming back to live and work on the boat, however, Sarm left the area and Ryan and had moved to Malta. And some theorize that the move could have been due to the couple splitting, but they could have rekindled at some point and that's why Sarm returned to live and work on the boat in January. However, they also could have been doing long distance. I'm not sure what exactly happened. On March 7th, 44-year-old Ryan Bain, Sarm's boyfriend, claims that he and Sarm returned to his catamaran after having drinks and dinner in Franks Bay, St. John at a restaurant called 420 to Center. According to Ryan, the couple fell asleep at around 10 p.m. after they watched a film and he allegedly awoke at 2 a.m. due to the sound of the anchor alarm going off only to realize that Sarm wasn't on board. And there are varying accounts of what happened next. So initially it was believed that Ryan went back to sleep and then at approximately on noon on Monday, so about 10 hours later, Ryan reported Sarm as missing and claimed that she may have fallen off his 47-foot boat. Another account claims that Ryan alerted his friends that Sarm was missing when he awoke at 2 a.m., but failed to notify authorities and went back to sleep, and then notified authorities later at noon. So in this version of details, it's obviously suspicious that Ryan didn't notify authorities as soon as he woke up to notice that Sarm was missing. However, some believe that it's possible that alcohol consumption could have affected his decision-making skills, and that's why he didn't call. The most prominent theory that's emerged now, though, is that Ryan did in fact contact the Virgin Island Police Department upon realizing that Sarm was missing when he awoke around 2 or 2.30 and that he may have even taken his dinghy to talk to police and given them a picture of Sarm and given them details as to what possibly happened that night. But if this is the case, some find it odd that Ryan would have contacted the Virgin Island Police Department instead of the Coast Guard, especially since Ryan claimed that Sarm may have fallen overboard. And I don't know anything about sailing personally, but apparently there are strict protocols and there's something called man overboard protocol in which there are specific steps and measures undertaken to notify surrounding boats and the coast guard that a person has potentially fallen overboard to help recover and find that individual and from the information we've gathered the protocol wasn't followed at all. Ryan also failed to call a DSC or a digital selective call over the radio, which would have notified the Coast Guard immediately that something was wrong and would have sent the boat's exact location. Ryan, as a charter boat captain, would have been trained and have full knowledge of these protocols and would have been expected to handle emergency situations like these, yet he failed to notify the Coast Guard for nearly 10 hours of SARM's disappearance. Further, I've read that after he spoke to the Virgin Island Police Department at around 2 or 2.30 a.m., they instructed Ryan to alert the Coast Guard that Sarm was missing, but we know that the Coast Guard wasn't alerted until approximately noon the next day, nine hours or ten hours later, and it makes us wonder why Ryan would put off calling the Coast Guard after notifying the Virgin Island Police Department. After doing some digging, I realized that there are laws regarding boating under the influence, or BUI, similar to driving under the influence. The BUI limit in the Virgin Islands is 0.08% and we know that Ryan was in fact drinking that night and I wonder if Ryan could have been avoiding or putting off calling the Coast Guard potentially to avoid getting in trouble for operating his boat or dinghy that night since he was intoxicated and potentially over that limit. Although this is a possible theory as to why Ryan may have put off calling the Coast Guard, it makes me wonder why he called the Virgin Island Police. Do they not have the same authority that the Coast Guard would have to 
test his BAC, his blood alcohol concentration. Also, even if they didn't have the same authority to test his BAC, wouldn't Ryan be concerned that they would tip off the Coast Guard themselves instead of just instructing Ryan to do so? It's also been reported that Ryan's father was also staying on the boat, and if this is the case, could it be possible that Ryan's father could have potentially been the one to wake up at around 2 a.m. and discover that Sarm was missing? If so, he may have been the one to wake Ryan up, and then Ryan may have been forced to act or call for help. This may at least explain why he mentioned waking up at 2 a.m. in his account of the details, even if he didn't call for help initially. However, some sources claim that Ryan's father didn't come into the picture until after Sarm's disappearance, so I'm not sure exactly when he came in. Ryan indicated that all of Sarm's belongings, including her identification, specifically her passport, I believe, and her phone were found on the boat. While this may indicate that Sarm did in fact return to the boat, it's entirely possible that Ryan brought her belongings back himself or that she never took her belongings off the boat to begin with. I'm not sure if it's common for people to carry their passports around when they're walking along the Virgin Islands. I know when I travel abroad, I don't usually carry my passport around, but I know some people do, so I'm not sure if that's something she calmly did. In terms of her phone, I know a lot of people carry their phones around with them wherever they go, but I also know that some people choose intentionally to leave their phone behind so they're not constantly checking it or on it. So not long after Sarm's disappearance, Ryan soon hired a lawyer named David Caddy who has represented some very high profile clients, including Galeen Maxwell. After the Coast Guard was finally notified that she was missing, the Coast Guard and the Virgin Island Police Department searched the waters but didn't find any trace of Sarm. When they were finally notified of Sarm's disappearance, they sent a team to conduct a search of the boat and to perform a standard vessel safety check, but Ryan stood in the doorway and did not allow the search team to go anywhere below the deck or to search any of the rooms. So the team was only allowed on the deck. For impeding officers by preventing their search, Ryan did receive a citation. However, they were not allowed to search. When Virgin Island Police later asked Ryan if they could do a search of the boat, he also declined. The initial search, which was already quite limited due to Ryan not allowing them to go anywhere but the deck, essentially, didn't include a forensic team coming on board, and I believe the police's search would have included a forensic team and been more extensive. Regardless, a thorough search has not been able to take place due to Ryan's refusal. Police have indicated that they would need to obtain a search warrant to search the boat without Ryan's permission. And in order to obtain that warrant, they do need probable cause. We know that Sarm lived on the boat, and we know that Ryan was the last person Sarm was with prior to her disappearance. Ryan even claims that Sarm was on the boat prior to her disappearance, which again was moored in a body of water. It's not like she could go off and go for a walk if she wanted to. In my opinion, it makes sense for the police to be able to obtain a search warrant just on these facts alone especially when we consider the fact that Ryan has a history of domestic violence. Not long after Sarm's disappearance, Ryan's former wife, Corey Stevenson, came out with her experience with Ryan during their marriage. She explained that Ryan's demeanor completely changed after they got married in 2008, and that she feared so much for her safety during their honeymoon that the trip had to be cut short. In 2011, Ryan attacked Corey, smashing her head into the floor, and had to be jailed for 21 days. He was then jailed once again for violating his two-year probation in 2013 after he was ordered not to contact his wife. The couple were officially divorced in 2014, but Corey was so terrified of Ryan that she allegedly slept with a shotgun throughout their divorce. Corey is now in constant communication with the Virgin Island Police Department regarding Ryan's past and claims that she suspects foul play in Sarm's disappearance. When it comes to theories, it's obvious what the most prominent theory here is, and in most cases, it makes sense to look at who the person was last with and the person's partner, and in this case, that's Ryan. It's hard for people to accept that Ryan awoke at 2 a.m. and didn't report Sarm missing until 10 hours later to the Coast Guard, especially if he was instructed to by the Virgin Island Police. The pair were anchored in the water approximately 50 yards from the shore, which means that there weren't many places for Sarm to go. It's, like I said, it's not like she could go for a walk if she wanted to, so there would have definitely been some sense of urgency, especially for someone so familiar with boating like Ryan. I've seen a friend of Ryan claim that Ryan went out to search for Sarm as soon as he realized that she was missing at around 2 a.m., but nearby occupants on other boats heard no commotion that night. They were shocked to learn the news that somebody had gone missing from a nearby boat because they heard no commotion. Somebody on a nearby boat was shocked that Ryan didn't wake them up or 
tell them that he needed help finding Sarm. So many doubt the story that Ryan's friend tells about Ryan going out and actually searching for Sarm when he woke up because they would have heard yelling or the dinghy. So like I said, it's confirmed that Sarm and Ryan were on the island that night having drinks and dinner. Based on Corey's experience with Ryan, we know that it's possible for Ryan to turn aggressive after consuming alcohol. And some think that it's possible that Sarm never made it back to the boat that night. Nearby witnesses on other boats claim that they saw Sarm earlier in the afternoon and also that evening prior to the couple leaving for drinks and dinner. However, none of them claim to have seen Sarm after the couple allegedly returned from the restaurant. In fact, according to investigators, including FBI agents who are now helping in investigation efforts, hours of CCTV footage could not confirm Ryan's claim that Sarm actually returned back to the boat with him the night following their dinner. If Ryan did something to harm Sarm, it's possible that he did this on land. Some believe that his refusal to let investigators actually on the boat to search is merely a distraction from where the real crime potentially occurred, or that he could be hiding something else, potentially illegal substances, on the boat. Although Ryan definitely looks suspicious to the public, law enforcement have been considering a multitude of possibilities. They've suggested that Sarm could have possibly left to start life on a new island, specifically St. Thomas. But this doesn't explain the circumstances surrounding her disappearance or why she hasn't resurfaced or contacted her family to let them know she's okay. Why wouldn't she take her belongings like her passport or her phone? I assume that she would want her identification at least, especially if she wants to eventually go back home. The possibility of Sarm relocating to a new island doesn't explain Ryan's refusal to allow the boat to be searched either. The possibility of Sarm falling or jumping off the boat has been proposed initially by Ryan himself. However, Sarm's friends do not believe that this is likely. According to her good friend Laura Taylor, Sarm is super smart, level-headed, and has a good head on her shoulders. I also want to emphasize that Sarm is an experienced swimmer and has experienced sailing. This is not her first time on a boat. She was on a boat sailing the Atlantic prior to meeting Ryan. If we consider the idea that Sarm had jumped off the boat to try to swim to shore, it's important to look at why she would do this. If Sarm needed to get back to land for some reason, why wouldn't she use the dinghy? Why would she be in such a hurry to make it off the boat? Or was it that she wasn't allowed to use the dinghy? Had Ryan and Sarm gotten into some sort of argument or an altercation that night? Did she feel like she was in danger and decide that it was best to try to swim back to shore? If Sarm did in fact jump off the water in the area they were anchored or moored in, was reported to be shallow and clear. Sarm would have either been able to swim back to shore or to another boat to get help or her body would have at least turned up by now had she not been able to make it back to shore or to another boat if she were too intoxicated or injured for some reason. To this day, searchers and divers have been unsuccessful in finding any trace of SARM in the water. But like I previously mentioned, on March 24th, it was released that the FBI would be a part of the ongoing investigative efforts. Two days later, on Friday the 26th, Ryan's boat left St. John's overnight. Initially, the Virgin Island Police Department didn't know where Ryan's boat was. However, they now claim to know where his whereabouts are and state that he is in their jurisdiction, which is obviously a good thing. They've stated that they are interested in speaking to him and searching his boat. However, they have said that he is not a person of interest. Due to increasing frustrations over the handling of the case, a private investigator has actually been hired to aid in the investigation. Oddly, however, it wasn't hired by Sarm's family and friends. The private investigator was hired by Ryan's side, which makes me wonder what kind of information the private investigator will dig up. However, hopefully the investigator will remain professional and objective and only real facts emerge. In terms of what's happening now, Police have determined that the chances of finding Sarm in the water or washed up on shore are slim. They've turned their search inland and are focusing on searching uninhabited islands and coves. For those of you who don't know, the U.S. Virgin Islands have dozens of small uninhabited islands surrounding the main island. So they're focusing on searching these islands along with small little coves. And along with the FBI, Southampton Hampshire Police, where Sarm is originally from, have also joined in to aid with the investigation and provide operational aid from the UK. However, Ryan is still not considered a suspect or even a person of interest, which personally I find very odd. Investigators are already questioning his account of details and questioning whether Sarm even made it back to the boat and have urged him to let 
investigators inspect the boat and the Coast Guard has even cited him for not allowing them to do so. Considering all of that suspicious behavior, along with his previous record of domestic violence, it would make sense to at least classify him as a person of interest and to obtain a search warrant to search the boat. Of course, this is just my opinion, but in other cases, police have been much quicker to call people persons of interest for much smaller things. As of today, Sarm is still missing. She is 5'8 and has a slim build. She has brown hair and has a large colorful tattoo on her shoulder of a seahorse, butterfly, and a flower. If you have any information about Sarm's whereabouts, you're asked to call the number down in the description below. And as always, I'll leave all my sources down in the description below, including a page that Sarm's family and friends have put together for updates updates on Facebook and their website. Putting together an accurate timeline of what actually happened has been incredibly difficult for this case due to the reporting and mixed accounts, but I tried to piece together what happened as best as I could, and there are a lot of different sources I used for this case, so keep that in mind. I really hope that Sarm is found safe and that she is truly just on another island somewhere and is unable to reach out because she doesn't have her phone. I don't think this is likely. I hope her family and friends are able to get answers soon. And that's all I have for this case. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe before you go. And if you're interested in other recent missing person cases, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I'll see you guys in my next one.